Welcome to Kinky Knots Cafe's Proactive is the Way. Proactive is the Way is a podcast brought to you by two sisters who dove into the health and wellness industry. One plan and the other by fate. We have joined forces to bring to you authentic conversations about our personal experiences as it relates to managing our health, working within the industry, and taking our combined knowledge to share with you some pearls of wisdom that you can take with you to live the best version of you. Over the next year, we will continue to host two episodes a month. And each month we will focus on a topic that is designed to increase an awareness of tools and resources to enhance an aspect of your mind, body, and spirit. Our topic this month, that good life. While discussing the good life, we will be focusing on the Hungarian American psychologist book, Flow, by Muhaili Shikson Miyahi. Last week, we had a fire and was displaced. While we managed to land on our feet like a cat with a bazillion lives, I couldn't help but to reflect on that moment and how we truly have a good life. You see, we are a family who tends to walk in faith and understands that when trials come our way, tribulations are soon to follow. But guess what, folks? It doesn't last forever. During those times, we merely extend our hand and welcome the guidance of the universe to do what it does best. With the understanding of our intentions and heart's greatest desire, we permit it to lead us on the path to that good life. So that good life, how do we define it? I suspect that it is different from one to the other as while we may be of one species, we generally have different principles that leverage, that we leverage to guide us in framing and sticking to what we tend to value most in life. So Tiff, <laughs> tough week last week, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our home that we grew up in since what third, third and fourth grade, respectively, was decimated. When you go through an experience like that, losing, you know, a piece of yourself, being shuttled from home to home, you tend to ask yourself, now, what is this life all about? Why did this happen? So let's kick things off. How do we define it? How, how do you, Tiffany, define meaning in life? From your perspective, what makes life so significant? What makes life so significant? for me, are the relationships with the things in my dimension or the things that surround me. So when I look at my work relation, my relationship with work is really big for me. Mm -hmm. um, my relationship with people, my relationship with my animals, Mm -hmm. um those those things for me relationship are what are what makes um life meaningful mm -hmm. 
would you find, do you find that there's anything else or do you feel that that is kind of one of the greatest uh, components um, for defining, or I shouldn't say defining, but, but making your life significant is just about the relationships that you have built, you've cultivated within your work, within your home life. Um, yeah, because if I because if I had to limit it to just like three or four, I would I would say those things are um, what I have found meaning in. Okay. Um, and then as a result, have um, made my life meaningful. Okay. Um, so even my relationship with um, academics, education. Yes. OK. Yeah, I I would say um, from from my perspective, when I when I first thought about this, because it, it was kind of difficult for me. I created the question, by the way, but I was like struggling to answer it. I was like, did. Exactly. Did I mean when I said that? Right. Because I know because it was kind of it's yeah. kind of broad. It is very broad, but I, you know, I was able to, I was able to um, boil it down to two uh, specific meanings for me. And uh, the first one uh, that I thought about was from a personal perspective, because, you know, I always talk about taking care of ourselves first uh, so that we can, you know, ensure that our cup is full to pour into others. Um, but I feel like when I think about what makes life so uh, significant, what makes it meaningful is when we have the opportunity to live uh, the desires of our heart, right? Mm -hmm. Without the imposition from others or even imposing our will on others. Uh, I remember yesterday, uh, my mom and I, we were having a conversation and I remember her saying to me, um, because we were going to get, uh, I was going to get passports for the kids, you know, and she was like, I just, you know, I just want you to live the will of God, you know, and I was thinking to her, what? Like, <laughs> where did that come from? Huh? Um, because she was, you know, I guess she doesn't want me to have my passport. I'm not sure. Um, you know, she was just concerned that I, I wanted to get my my passport, uh, which I was getting for myself and our children because we're supposed to be um, heading out on college tours uh, in the next couple of months. And Aja, you know, she wants to head to Canada to take a look at a school there. So um and I don't know, my mom was concerned about me going out of the country again. She she truly wants me to like never leave the U.S. ever again. Um, but anyways, and so I was I was just sharing with her. I said, you know, Ma, we, we really have to be mindful that when we talk about the will of God, um, you know, think about where you get that statement from. And are you truly uh, speaking from the perspective of God or are you speaking from your own will, your own desire, mm -hmm. right? I said, because if you think about yourself as a parent, if you think about yourself as a parent, what are some of the greatest things that you want me to be in life? And, you know, she starts going through all of her different um. Uh, things. Well, I just want you to be independent. I want you to be able to take care of your children. I said, I said, okay, so let's stop there. You know, I said, Ma, I said, if this is the, what you desire of me, why do you think God desires even more? I believe that when we talk about the will of God, God desires or wants the things that we want, that want for us, I should say, rather. He would want what we want. And that's the whole reason why you kind of have these, these, um, uh, these messages, these communications coming from your conscience with regards to what you feel is Is his will. And then what I want to know is 
How do you know you're not God? First of all, bingo. So <laughs> we, are a, we are a reflection, right? We are a, a reflection of. And when I say that, because we do have the communications. I, I don't look at God as a single source. I look at God as collective. It's a collective source, a collective source of energy, a collective source of messages, a collective source of guidance. And I, I truly believe if um, leveraging, because and this is so key, uh, I, I really believe we need to have this kind of class in uh, schools, but leveraging our gift of discernment, learning how to leverage that more, more effectively, we take those messages and we start crafting, you know, kind of our own principles, our own values, right? Mm -hmm. And what we define as um, good and, and what works for us, et cetera. And, and the reason why I say, and I wasn't um, trying to be um, smart, I look to say, how do you know um, that you're not God? But if you look at provisions for human life, um, if you look at provisions for human life, the will of God obviously includes a provision for freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, freedom of expression, mm -hmm. freedom to do good, freedom to do bad, right? Honestly, because it is in all of that is our is our, our is our learning process. Right. Um, and and so I think it's so important. But I, I just I wanted to bring that up because I I was telling her, I said, Ma, I said, I absolutely I am living the will of God. Because what I truly desire, as long as I'm not imposing my will on others, it's going to be what he desires for me. Because he gives us the freedom to choose, right? And, and I think it's too complex to, um, to um, present to someone about the will that they have interpreted um, of someone else's because how do I know you didn't misinterpret that? Which we do very often. Absolutely. Uh, or not and misinterpret, but maybe that's just based on your upbringing, based on the information, your values, your, values, your mm -hmm. background. Or what you choose to value. Exactly. How you interpret it, right? Oh, I get that. And so, yeah. And so I was like, we got to be really careful about saying that all the time. What is God's will? It is not a uniform will, FYI. It right? can be, because if you look through the Bible, he, he has different wills for every character in the Bible. Right. Right. There was a different will from from the the first what are the first five chapters the Pentateuch all the way through the the New Testament. There's a different will in every chapter. Right. So 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 we have we have to be mindful of that. And so when I started thinking about you know the significance of life, the meaning of life, I just thought to myself, you know, we are going to live live the desires of our heart, you know, as long as we are being mindful that when we are living those desires, we are being mindful not to impose our will on others, right? Um, the secondary piece that I said, you know, that helps me to understand or what makes life so significant is, um, is the whole notion that we are guides to others, and because we are guides to others, in that comes great responsibility. And I'm just going to bring this up because, you know, we walk around in life on a daily basis and um, we, we serve to guide others. And sometimes we do it knowingly. And sometimes we don't realize that we are doing it because we are being worked through others. Um, and so it's just very important that when we guide, you know, we guide effectively. 
there also needs to be a course on that which uh, is something I, that I've been uh, thinking about putting together. But but you'll have to expand on that because that too is broad. So basically, are you saying that your inspiration should be responsible? I, like, what are you? Absolutely. Your inspiration, your guidance to others, right? So you were talking about your relationships, right? For you, what makes life so significant are the relationships that you have. But within those relationships comes great responsibility. For example, with your animals, right? Your animals have a dependency upon you, right? Mm -hmm. You decided to go purchase those animals. You brought them in your home. And now you are serving to make sure that they are well taken care of, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're guiding them with regards to, you know, what's appropriate to do in the house, what's not appropriate to do in the house. You're making sure that they are fed, getting exercise, right? And so in that, you are serving as a guide for your animals. You are, um, and, and, and in doing so comes a great responsibility because you decided um, to, to uh, you decided to be a part of their lives and invite them into your life, right? Um, is that what, or is that what you meant when you said help? help to define that? Was that good enough for you or do you need further? I mean, <clears throat> it can, we can build on it. Okay. Okay. Um, I just think it's a complex and I, and I actually kind of just don't like, like when you and mommy go back and forth about the will of God, because if that's the case, the will of God also says, don't sit your ass on the couch and watch TV all day and let your legs swell. <laughs> What are you talking about? The will of God doesn't want you to be a couch potato. Right, right, right. That's not inspiring anyone. That's inspiring death. Exactly. Like, like you, like, so I don't know why y'all go back and forth about the will of God. It's too complex. It's too complex. That's like talking about somebody about, talking to somebody about their bank account. You don't know what they got in their damn bank account. Right, right. So like, I don't, I don't know. That is just so, I don't know. It's not intrusive. I know she doesn't mean any harm. No, I, I love mommy to death, but just stuff on stuff like that. Oh, she just, oh, my skin, my whole spirit come up out my, my feet all the way to my, she just make, cause she said something the other day that I was just like, mommy, stop. No, mm -hmm. stop. Mm -hmm. I had to stop her because I was like, I'm going to go off and I don't want to go off. It's not even necessary anymore. Right. It's not necessary. I, I, I felt like I have, and not necessarily um, proved, but I have um, established um, a standard. This is what you can expect from me. Mm -hmm. So if that is what you can expect from me and that's how it's going to be, then you really shouldn't have no questions about, you know, yeah, like you, what it is I'm doing. You move away. You, you just let right. it. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting that you said that because I had a friend send me a, um, a text this week um, and this was about relationships. And basically it says you don't get to you don't get to choose to tell people how to treat you, but you do get to choose not to participate. And I didn't respond because I said, you know what, I'm not going to participate then. Yeah. You know, so I choose not to participate. It's mm -hmm. not, it says I don't get, since I don't get a vote, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. not participating. Yeah. So, I, cause it, I, you know, I want, I want my, I don't like when things affect my, my mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, And I try to keep stuff far away from me that um could potentially have that impact mm -hmm. or remodel my thinking from what I know has worked for me. Right. Because I've always been articulate. I've always been able to communicate with anybody. Right. Like I could communicate. I could leave right now. If there was a transient on the street, I might not feel that comfortable, but I could communicate with them. Right. And I can gauge, you know, the communication to where. So I feel comfortable communicating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel um, comfortable participating when I feel like something is going to um, 
piece away my wholeness. Mm -hmm. Like, or what I feel that makes me whole. Right. Right. No, so. so. Yeah. So I think that um, I want to, I want to do a shift because I think that when we talk about meaning, we talk about, you know, our lives and what makes it so significant. I always want to understand, um, do we understand why we are here, right? <laughs> why, and why? then why are some people chosen? Like they know mm-hmm. why they are here and why, and why the rest of us can't hear why we are here. Right, right, yeah. And when you, when you can't hear or when you when you need more support because you have not been chosen, you know, how do you go about cultivating purpose within your life? So let me, let, let, let's, let's expound on that a little bit. When you we... know, there's a really good book on that. The purpose driven life by Joel Osteen. Okay. Okay. Tell me a little something about it. No, that was it. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, 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 there's a book about it. But yeah, tell me. What, I mean, what's your perspective on it? I, I've seen the book. I've never read it though. Um, just it, briefly. Uh, it was probably a long time ago you read yeah, it. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. And I'm trying to um remember um the details, but he knew his purpose. Right. He knew, and he doesn't say it, but he's a prosperity preacher. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and those things were real for him. Mm-hmm. But could he be inspirational enough? Could can he be powerful enough to put that drive in other people? Mm-hmm. It's impossible because I think most other people are using success, using prosperity as a destination. And as we know, when you aim for it, you always miss it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you aim for something, you always miss it. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, and so, I probably should expand on that, but I will in two weeks. Oh, okay. Because I was gonna say when you aim on it, mm-hmm. you miss it. I was going to say so. What instead of aiming, what would you suggest? Instead of aiming, hold on, I'll tell you. Um. Uh. Instead of aiming, um, you just, you just prepare. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So, so, so don't aim without preparation. Don't, don't start moving forward without having a, a goal or or I should say a, a plan, right? Because what did they say? A dream without plans. Or a, is it a goal or a dream? Um, it must ensue. So for example, I'll use me, I'll use an example. Mm-hmm. I aim to go to medical school, mm-hmm. right? Remember I was doing medical minority education program. I got accepted at Baylor, but then I ended up going to Case Western. Remember, mm-hmm. and that's, and I stayed up there in Africa and Mahogany and all of them lived up there in Cleveland. <clears throat> And I did that program. Mm-hmm. But then what happened actually was nursing, mm-hmm. right? And nursing ended up choosing me. And it's just that it can't it can't be pursued. It has to ensue you. Okay. So it has to choose you in a way. So by but you were you were walking on the path of becoming a doctor, right? But these are energies and forces that we don't have control over that surround us, right? Mm-hmm. So even though I was surrounded by this is who I want to be, I'm still in the I'm still in, in the there in the surroundings, right? Mm-hmm. But um, because even your friends that you highlighted, uh, they're not 
medical doctors per se, right? So after, yeah, um, yeah, a, doc- a dentist, a dentist, right? Her sister's a nurse practitioner. Her her other sister's a lawyer. Her brother's a doctor. Okay, um, so so you you're you're don't aim, but you should you should move in that direction and then allow it to ensue you. Yeah, and ensue you. Okay, so I, I I'll get, expand on it. I'll, I'll I'll give the topic a little bit more discussion. Okay, when we when we dive, yeah, I need to develop it. I need okay. to develop that. Okay, okay, that can kind of get that can kind of get confusing. Okay. Yeah. I, I, Cause I would like to learn a little bit more about where you were going with that. I think that would, would help our, our listeners better understand um, with regards to um, cultivating, you know, kind of purpose within their lives. How, how do they do that? How to do that uh, most effectively. Um, and if you want to add, uh, definitely chime in here, but I'll share. I felt like, you know, in order to live, Um, the desires within our life. So as I was sharing with you earlier, how do I define meaning in my life? Um, It's about living our desires uh, of our heart. But in order to live the desires, we must be in constant pursuit of uh, growth uh, and development. And you talked Mm -hmm. about earlier about education. I believe that we have to be consummate learners. Uh, constantly upgrading ourselves on a path to uh, being progressive and living in excellence, right? Um, Living in excellence. I I believe we also have to be open, you know, making sure that we share that knowledge uh, with the intention to help others on their plight, Um, being gardeners in a sense. Living, living because you're driven. Yes. You're driven to live. Yeah, being driven to live and then also being driven to help others um, with, you know, as they are uh, moving forward. So serving, um, you know, not necessarily as a formal mentor, uh, but where we have the capabilities to um, provide guidance, um, we we do do that. Um, and how do we do that effectively, right? Uh, that definitely we have to be mindful of how we do that because some people can take offense to that. Um, but and who cares about offenses when you're using your talents and um, when you're using your talents and your abilities and your gifts um, to shape others or to shape um, shape your surroundings? Sure, sure. I, and I say offensive from a perspective of you want to be an effective communicator because sometimes the way that we communicate. Uh, I know when I started off earlier in my um, career, I had a I had a hard time with telling people versus sharing information versus, um, as I was mentioning earlier, being a gardener uh, by planting the seed. Uh, And then every now and again, you know, checking in, watering it, checking in, weeding it, um, and then just making sure that I step away from individuals and just let nature have its way. Just let things take their course uh, based on the nurturing that I've provided them, right? Um, The other point that I wanted to hone in on here was Uh, helping folks to understand um, that in this, as we are cultivating purpose, you know, realize that there will be good days. Uh, There will be bad days. Uh, It's a whole song. Is it? (laughs) I've had some, some good days. No, I've had some bad days. I've had some hills to climb. That one. Yeah. Yeah. So there will be good days. There'll be bad days. Um, There'll be days where we don't know what the hell is going on, you know, just and 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 we're indifferent to that. Um, And it is within all of that, within all those experiences, the good, the bad and indifferent. Mm. All good. All right. So let me ask you this, Tiffany, if you could look back on your life or even currently within your present life, um, what? Yeah, because I like to stay present. I like to stay present. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, but uh, in in um, in the spirit of 
helping us to hone in the most optimal experience within our life, um, which could be a continuation right up into today, uh, up until today. What was the most optimal experience that you had within your life? That was meaningful, that that was purposeful. That you feel like gave me direction or what? Um, and you can take that whichever direction you want to go in. Oh, I know having Taryn. Okay. Mm hmm Okay. Because now, you know, as hard as it was for me, um, you know, mothering, um, and, you know, not really feeling capable. Um, but now I can see, um, that I was capable, um, and um, I, I think I was talking to Daryl about this last night and I didn't, I didn't, and as smart as I, I believe that I am, mm -hmm. um, I didn't know how to apply grace. Mm -hmm. So I was really, really um, hard on my, on my uh, mothering experience. Okay. Well, I got to go into the details of that, but I, um, uh, having her, um, and now looking back mm -hmm. at, uh, um, I appreciate the challenges that I had mm -hmm. actually. And, 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 and the reason why I'm saying that is because, because of what I do as, um, as a nurse practitioner, I'm able to connect even better with patients who, um, come to me and talk to me and have told me an experience mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't, um, I don't impose, mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I am able to have a perspective that allows them to tell me their story mm -hmm. it, because, because I know what I went through. Mm -hmm. Um, so having Taryn, um, um, was your optimal experiences in is that? one of my op most optimal experience I still kind of don't know what she's here for or what she was kind of like like here because I really feel like the people that are inserted mm -hmm. along your path mm -hmm. like because I honestly I said this the other day I said I think I was just meant mm -hmm. as a vessel to bring this person into the world um I I, I still don't know what the the meaning of all that was because, you know, uh, her dad and I didn't have a relationship right. um, her entire life. So, mm -hmm. but um, I feel like I'm getting closer to the, to the meaning of that, but she has brought, um, she has brought to me a better understanding of um, certain things I was struggling with mm -hmm. and um, how to, how to be, I think, she helped me because you know how hard I used to be. Oh, I used to be. Uh, I'm. I was worse than what I am now. Walking on eggshells. That's what y'all always used to I'm say. Like, you gotta walk on eggshells. I, I was. I was. Yeah. So I think you know the birth of Taryn was like if it could be a title of a book, it would be like the birth of Taryn completes a softer approach in Tiffany or something because I was so fucking mean like I was if, if I I was mean then I feel like I'm nicer now you are you definitely have you definitely have changed because you I didn't, soften soften you absolutely yeah, I don't I, but I don't think I was mean in a sense of like it wasn't intentional Mm -hmm. I think it built over a defense um, mechanism, but I think what I see moving forward is that like Taryn is going to eventually be like a support mm -hmm. and not like the support we give to our mother. Mm -hmm. Not that kind of support, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I just get these different feelings. I don't, I don't have all of it, but I feel like her presence, um, her being inserted in my life was huge for me. Mm -hmm. was a was a turning point for me because I think I was probably spiraling downward okay okay and she was brought in to kind of lift you uplift you 
right? Or help you to see. So help me see the sunnier side. Mm -hmm. Help me to see the sunnier side of life because I can remember when I was studying and um, she would call herself trying to feed herself. And <laughs> she <laughs> learned how to use. Smart. Let me tell you. She was so smart. Yes. The girl, <laughs> her little self. <laughs> And jump and climb up. I'll never forget. That's all I keep thinking about how she would how climb. she climb. Yeah, how she would climb and she wasn't uh, scared to climb. Right. And um and how she used to uh climb up on the cabinets. Yeah. And, and I would wake up and she had fixed a whole meal. And this was at three, at three years old. Yes. I was like, what in the world is this kid doing? She used to drive me nuts. <laughs> but yeah, um, that's very oh. cute. And I, and I like that you honed in on kids. Once again, you and I do, 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 do. <laughs> freaking aligned again um, because, you know, one of the most optimal experiences in my life was children, you know, when I when I had my beautiful babies and I especially Brittany. Yeah, I mean, she was Toya. I will never forget. Remember when y'all stayed in that small ass apartment in New York City? <laughs> and we all slept in the bed together it was me you and um andrew and i i was kicking him i was like man this bed too small to be all of us sleeping in there but Brittany was over in her crib and she woke up and with her big eyes she came over to her she was like mommy <laughs> <laughs> i was like I love her. And then well, I, I think I I think when you went to work one day and y'all lived in that other apartment in the Bronx, yes. it was bigger. Yes, two bedroom. Yeah, it was huge. Mm -hmm. And um, she was going in the trash can. And that was the first time I made a mistake as an aunt. I screamed at her. And she, um, I was like, ow, that's nasty. Get out the trash can. And she was so scared. I was like, I'm so sorry. I saw her face. Because, you know, oh, my God, I love Brittany. Yes, yeah. my little Brittany. So, um, and, you know, I have. Uh, four... I love all your children. <laughs> Thank you. No, no. Yeah, they love you, too. I'm... May's my favorite. So. May, May <laughs> is my favorite <laughs> of you. I don't know how that happened. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, this... You had two of my children. I'm, I'm very, I'm very positive that I should have probably had three children. Yeah. You, you had two of them. Yeah, well, you should have because I remember telling Ma I was never having kids. I was like, um, I am never having kids. And, and you, remember how I used to go get the kids every you weekend? Like a hundred thousand kids you used to babysit to, doing diapers. I used to be looking at you like she is crazy. You know, I loved kids. Oh my goodness! And I then, wanted, I oh. wanted, and here I am, one, one, and I got four. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I work? Because you know, up where I work, there's a lot of um uh children who don't have parents. There's there's signs everywhere that say, oh, be an adoptive, you know, parent or be a foster. Yeah. And so <laughs> I told daddy, I was like, I'm gonna get me a Hispanic baby. He was like, You are not. I said, Well, I want a son. He was like, No, do not do that. He said, Live your life. Mm -hmm. well, I think my life would be complete with a, a a boy I've always wanted a boy and as a matter of fact I thought Taryn was going to be a boy but that's what I get see you aim for a target and you <laughs> missed it that's not what you needed <laughs> well you I think you know what I probably would have made my son a um, punk he probably would have been crying all the time because <laughs> 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 that's like oh. I was like no we don't need oh. we don't need no more punks you well, you know that's kind of true because with girls, I feel like we're harder on girls, and then with my son, I am, I am a bit of a softy with him. Um, and I was like, is it because he's the only one, or he's just soft with me? You know, he really like takes care of me, asks me what I need. You know, he's and he not his sisters. But me, <laughs> I mean, you can ask your sisters too, you know. I needed, I needed one of those. Yeah, I mean, he's always taking care of me. I call him my little man. I was like, you a little man at a house. And every time we go out, I'm like, are you going to protect me? I need my bodyguard, you know. And he's looking at me like, mommy, you can be your bodyguard. I'm like, yes, you, you are my bodyguard. He said, I still play video games when you fall asleep. Yes. <laughs> 
starts giggling like hysterically, like, what? Me? <laughs> My yes, your little self. But anyways, it's you know, very difficult for people to understand um, whether it's an adoptive baby, you know, biological or um, not biological. I think when you do have children, um, it's it's difficult to understand what true love is until you welcome a little one into your life. Uh, you, you know, someone who is so vulnerable and impressionable. When they come into your life, it's really at that moment uh, that you realize that you would do the world for them. And uh, I think I've transferred that energy to animals. Yeah, animals, but you, and even other people, because you start to have a different perspective on life, don't you think? I think the center of that, though, comes from um, caring, caring for people. Absolutely. But children bring out I mean, caring, the, the concept of caring. I'm the sorry. concept of compassion, yeah. Caring, being more compassionate, um, having a greater sense of understanding. Now, I'm not telling all of y'all to go out and populate the earth, okay? <laughs> we got an environment to think about, but <laughs> I just want to be- we got, some, we got some carbon footprints. <laughs> that we need to, we need to, <laughs> to erase. <laughs> No, I'm just teasing. But um, it is truly when you do have um, uh, someone that is, uh, you know, that depends on you. Um, it, it is at that moment that you realize that you'll do the world for them. You'll protect them. You'll educate them. And you tend to aspire um, to guide them on the right path. And we don't always have the tools, right? I don't care. Even the greatest doctor, psychologist, what was his name? Dr. Spock, even him, you know, I was thinking about how uh, he he writes about children, et cetera. But even in himself, you know, it was difficult to even raise his own child. Um, so we 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 aspire to guide them on the right path. Um, uh, that that's just something that that comes out of having a child. Uh, but I also think you know, in order for us to to do that most effectively, we truly have to within ourselves we have to take a vested interest in um, walking our own path, um, making sure that they have an opportunity to see how foundations are built um, and taking that opportunity to leverage our particular life experiences to help them carve out their own place within life most effectively. Um, so I, I think that, uh, yes, children for sure, um, was one of the most optimal experiences that I had within my life that that helped me to grow, um, develop, and, and cultivate who I am today. Right? Um, I think, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, please share. No, I was just saying that um, <clears throat> when you say optimal experiences too, I think um, the relationship um, we had with sports um, also. Mm -hmm. um, provided us with optimal experiences. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know what? Do you ever think like, um, like with, okay, everybody who is on this earth has a part, has a role. And if they don't accomplish that role, how that stands to affect the greater good. Do you I believe that is a thing? Okay. Cause I'm about to tell you, you just, it's a wonderful segue into my last question for you, right? Um, absolutely. We are all tied together, okay? We have lost this notion um, because we don't necessarily um, educate our children in school about it, but um, pro in, in, before we had language, right? And I always talk about this, you know, we communicate it uh, telepathically, um, we communicated in ways uh, that that were designed to help us guide one another. And, you know, I wrote a book. I started writing a book. It's called um, God, Guides of Destiny. And I'm going to continue with that book because I truly believe that we have to be mindful that we all bring value within this life. And even 
in an individual who is in the most deplorable state within their life adds value. And I and I think so often about how individuals um, tend to be God and take other people's lives. I'm like, God damn, you just took a key. Stop taking lives. You don't know what that person was designed to do. And you just ripped that life, probably hindering us from being able to be more progressive or more. That is funny that you said that because when I was younger in high school, I will never forget this bumper sticker. Mm-hmm. And it was talking about abortion. Mm-hmm. And it said, it said, um, God, why don't you send someone to help us? And he said, I sent somebody to help you, but you keep killing them. Mm-hmm. Aborting them, yeah. Mm-hmm. Aborting them. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was an abortion, but that was for abortion. So that's interesting that you say that because. I don't want to get on that topic, but whatever. No, you can get on that that topic because I think it's because you know, that's actually you know because they've tried to politicize that, and so it it has become so complex, and you know it's really kind of ruin it's ruining the world, like politicizing you know something like that. Well, I, I think we have to be be we have to be mindful too about abortion. I I don't agree with that. Life begins at conception. I don't. Oh no! I and even though I consider myself a scientist, I don't believe that either. Yeah, I, I I've never been a believer, I, but I do believe that when a child takes their first breath, once that child takes their first breath, a their soul is whole. They have now they have come into this world and they have a purpose. Okay, um, I, I I believe that there is a reason for abortion. Um, and I think it's very important that uh, we allow women to make the decision for themselves, because if a an individual brings a child into this world and they don't have the capability, um, I think it's their right to make a decision. Yeah, like the nurturing, um, the um, the ability to educate, love, all of that, because to have, when uh, that Roe versus Wade thing hit, and just real quick, and they overturned it, <clears throat> I went on Twitter, because that's really the only um, social media platform that I have open. Okay. Uh, well, all of them are open, but I don't, I don't go on. Uh, <laughs> they, um, it's, oh God, where was I going with that? It just slipped right out my brain. Okay. Um, when the Roe versus um, Wade was overturned, what happened? Oh, God. They politicized it. Say what you just said again, and I, I forgot so I can remember. Oh, I was just sharing that. I think that women should have the the right to make a decision because we don't know, you know, what was the background for that. We don't know, you know, what um, underlying factors uh, caused the woman to, and I know I'm, I'm adding a little bit more here, but we don't know That's what fine, the factors were um, that 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 helped the woman to, I shouldn't say help, but that that made that woman want to make the decisions that they that they made, right? That they had to make, and so that and okay, so that's what I was gonna say. Mm-hmm. So um, on Twitter. It was a whole thread of they need to leave abortion legal. And these were mainly Caucasian responders, mm-hmm. Twitter response, some Twitter responses, because I was looking at the pictures, looking at the pictures. Mm-hmm. One, t- one Twitter response was, um, my mother did not want me, and I wish she had aborted me because my life has been terrible. Mm-hmm. And that those weren't the words. But that's basically what she said. So you have these unwanted children. And you know what? All day in my clinic, mm-hmm. um, and probably at least three times a week, I go over with women about having unwanted children. Mm-hmm. Because culturally in the Hispanic population, they have multiple multiples. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and, and it derives out of um, cultural and religious because they're Catholic, mm-hmm. mainly Catholic. Yeah. Um, and they don't believe in birth control or that was the the um historical thought. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh 
I have that conversation because you have these women that don't don't have children that they really wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was so um gosh, that was so uh that really struck me as oh my goodness, you know, I don't really think I thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. But um yeah, that's all I was gonna say about that. Yeah, is that is that um it has its role. Yes. Right. It has a role, like, but I think they politicize it because there's this thing about Caucasian people mm -hmm. and they are having children. White women are having children at a slower rate than any other group of people. And so to maintain power, you got to have the people. Mm -hmm. And they feel like they're losing ground. And in California, they are. Mm -hmm. They've lost ground. Right. But um, they're not populating as they're not as populous as other um, groups of people. And this disturbs them. I, I, and I told you there was a book that there's a it's a white guy who wrote it, um, uh, who was talking about that. I got to get the name of that book. I think I said that in a couple episodes ago. Well, it's a white Before. woman who talks about it. Oh, OK. But he was just talking about how, um, you know, the abortion is a is a race issue. Um, this is about uh, making sure that a particular population um, does not lose ground. Um, yeah, because I would, I work, I work for a very large organization which will remain nameless. Okay. And um, and I wrote about her since um being in um uh in DMP being in my doctoral program. Mm -hmm. Um, but her name was Sanger, and she believed in eugenics. Mm -hmm. So that is how this organization got established she was one of the one of the influencers or one of the founders mm -hmm. and it was okay for persons of color to come in have as many abortions as you want as a matter of fact we'll pay for them so it was called eugenics mm. just look it up okay very interesting and um and it was okay for them to as long as they're doing it it's okay to have abortion. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. And they they were purposefully, these clinics were purposefully placed in places where there were high um rates of other instances of of um yeah of mm -hmm. uh, minorities. And I wrote about it. And my I think if my um professor, because it was during COVID, so um we were online she she sometimes didn't come into the classroom mm -hmm. but I believe she would have came and just like hugged me because she said I did not know any of this mm -hmm. that's what she told me and as a matter of fact I wish I still had the recording because she had to record her responses to our to our work mm -hmm. and she was like this is just like an amazing piece of writing and she was like, I feel like I learn from you every time I read something of yours. Mm -hmm. And so I really like dug into, you know, how how abortion has um, affected uh, minority groups, but how they want to um, prevent it for prevent it and politicize it for, uh, yeah, racial reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, prevent it for uh, more of white women. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's that's an interesting topic. We'll we'll probably get to talk about that, you know, because um, and I don't know where we could fit that in. It probably won't be in uh, this particular series for this this year, uh, but we'll definitely talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, I mean, we we talk about. And I'm just to go back to what you had shared earlier, I know that we kind of jumped on that, but with yeah. regards to if if you believe that. Uh, individuals serve as a key um, to, you know, to the development um, of other, to the development or the progression of others or, or. Right. And uh, if they don't do their part, how mm -hmm. does it impact? Yeah. How does it impact? Right. Um, and so I, it's a great segue as I was about to get into our, our final question uh, as it related to, you know, when when we're faced with a challenge, um, what is our point of view? You know, what what is our point of view when we have challenges within our life? Do you 
Do you see challenges as threats or do you see them as opportunities for action? And I actually grabbed that from the book and we'll be reflecting on this a little bit more in a couple of weeks. And you know not to ask me nothing like that because you know I love a challenge. Hell, I create them. (laughs) (laughs) Just to jump over them, just to to wade and go through them. Girl, I said, that is so funny. I swear as God is my witness, my partner... He does that too. I was like, you be creating shit just so you can just go through it, don't you? Like, what the hell? Just crazy in the waters. I swear, no, really and truly, and I I say this all the time. People who do, I was like, you must be very bored because I swear it's got you literally create shit just so you can see if you can get through it. Help me to understand that. Now, now I was saying mine. I was saying to do that. I was saying mine in jest. Um, but uh, it almost feels like I create challenge. I think they just come my way because you do have um, a certain energy about you and, and challenges come your way. One to test your response. And I think now like uh, being reflected, I think mine have always been to test my emotional um, intelligence to determine when are you going to stop acting a fool? Cause I pop off. I I did it yesterday with the pharmacist. I've been per- allowing me to prescribe Ozempic for the last two months to a medical patient. And then y'all going to tell me today on the day that she has due, she has to give her injection weekly. It's a weekly injection to help the weight loss. You've probably seen it on TV. Okay. It's, it's <laughs> semaglutide. Yeah, but everybody want to get started on it. And now they come into the clinics because they're like, we can, we can get a clinic provider to to give us semaglutide, to give us Ozempic, give us Wagovi. I said, instead of working out, instead of changing your diet, I had one patient, he stopped drinking pop. He lost 20 pounds in one month. <laughs> but y'all think it's, y'all think it's the drug, but okay. Yeah. So anyway, so me and a pharmacist was talking. Well, first it wasn't the pharmacist and I, it was another, it was the, like, you know, the gatekeeper, the, uh, the help. Mm-hmm. Um, she was like, um, you know, uh, we're not going to be able to, uh, fill this medication for the patient unless you put a diagnosis of diabetes. Um, I said, ma'am, I said, she don't have diabetes. I said, her BMI is 54 though. Mm -hmm. I said, so she needs it. And I said, and now you want me to call the patient and so I said, forget it. Let me speak to a pharmacist. I speak to the pharmacist. So she must be new because she said, well, FDA hasn't approved as a weight loss regimen then. I said, well, I'll be damned. It's been a weight loss <laughs> regimen for since last year, but I don't know when it started. It's been a weight loss regimen. And it, honey, well, what the hell was y'all feeling it for as a weight loss regimen? Because that was the diagnosis code I sent over with the man when I asked him. So anyway, long story short, they said yesterday they can't feel it because she a medical patient. She should have never been getting it. Whole mistake. Oh, I was livid. Oh, I was furious because this, this patient has been coming in my office. I mean, so it's so sad. A BMI of 54. Mm -hmm. Do you know how big this girl is? She just had a baby. And after she had the baby, it was just rapid weight gain. I checked her for everything. I said, I don't know what condition you have, but this is exaggerated. This is, I mean, maybe we should study this. This is just Mm -hmm. dynamic. Mm-hmm. The weight gain that she that she has, right? Mm-hmm. And she gonna you gonna die of heart disease tomorrow with this BMI at fifty four, and she young too, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, I was furious. I was like, um, and I was about to pop off, but then I was like, don't do it. Mm-hmm. You being tested. This is your challenge. Mm-hmm. Your emotional intelligence. You do want your IQ to remain high, right? You want your uh-huh. you want your emotional IQ to be perceived as elevated. Mm-hmm. So I um I softened what I was about to say to her because I was about to let loose. Mm-hmm. Keep in mind, I got people on my right and my left. I'm not in that office by myself. Mm-hmm. Which anyway. But yeah, I think for challenges, I think um, I appreciate a challenge because I I, I like to um, think critically. I like to sit around and think. I don't mind having thoughts. I like I like thinking. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, um, challenges help you to do that. I think challenges, um, are here to build you, build your character. Mm -hmm. Um, so I appreciate how they come. Mm -hmm. Um, it's here to teach me something. It is, you know, it definitely is. Each, each challenge is an opportunity for, for growth. It is in that challenge. You will see growth. Um, and and I, I I value that. I value that because sometimes if we aren't pushed or challenged, we won't take the time to find a solution for a particular issue, right? right. And um, it's it's in those moments where you know we feel like there is no hope, there is no light, there is no end uh, of the light at the there is no light at the end of the tunnel that all of a sudden something sparks in us and we're like, oh, here's the solution, right? Um, and when I, when, I, uh, when I thought about this respective question, it made me think about, I don't know if you recall the story of a Spanish woman um, and she was struggling. She had two kids. She didn't know how she was going to feed them. She didn't know how she was going to take you know, take care of them. We're talking about abortion, right? So guess what she what, what she tried to do? She ends up putting a gun to both of her children. She kills, she kills the girl and shoots the boy in the back, but he manages to live, right? Um, and that hurt me. I ended up uh, writing a poem. I don't know what happened. The moment I read it, as soon as I read it, this poem just flowed out of me. Um, and I had to write it real quick. I was just writing because I was just livid. And I, I'm going to read this poem to you because I think it's very important that people know that life is not perfect. It never will be. Life will have good days. You will for sure have bad days. Um, but within that, that is not the moment that you make a decision to kill someone or yourself. Because that person, as you had shared before, serves as a key. We don't know what door they will unlock. But each one of us has to go through so that we can find the solution. And so the poem I wrote is called, What If I Told You? What if I told you your daughter you killed solved world hunger? Her plight in life will be no blunder. She will have to go through what it feels like to possess stomach pains. Desiring the moistness of one single grain so that she can devise a solution for man, God's plan. What if I told you your son you shot possesses a beautiful gift, possibly jeopardized because of the wounds you left, a future tattered, dreams shattered. The seed you carried once brought into this world is no longer yours to decide. You have no jurisdiction on one's life once they take that first breath. You are their mother to guide, to rear until death. Your constant interference trying to craft one's destiny is in the hands of the universe, a gift to the world, our blessing. My sister, you have been led astray I pray for your son. Please let the hands that touch him heal him. And 
I close with the fallacy of it all. All right, folks. I'm sorry. That was a bit much. Every time I think of that story, I think about how we have to be so mindful that we we are stewards and we have to be positive stewards, good stewards, so that we can see the growth and progressiveness of our future generations. All right, so, (laughs) sorry, didn't mean to end on an emotional note, Uh, but that's a wrap for our conversations today. I truly hope that you all enjoyed that, but of course we are not going to end on a tearful moment because we are lovers of music. And uh, to kick things off uh, for our first episode of That Good Life and prepare our mind for the weeks ahead, we will debut our song for this episode. Tiffany, and I'll I'll let you decide. Do you have a song choice or are you still? No, kind of- and you know what? I'm going to be honest. I forgot. Oh, no. Guess what? Because I got you, girl. I got you. Right. Exactly. Giving a little Kanye. <laughs> oh God! Give a little Kanye West uh, and T T Pain some love uh, uh, this that's today um, with the Good Life. Uh, they actually have a song out called The Good Life, and I, I love it. Now the way that they define a good life is a little hot mess, but you know I think it's so important that. Um, we take the time to have an understanding of what that means for us and try to try our best, you know, to, to live that good life. Um, Within the song, he talks about like, we always do at this time. I go for mine. I gots to shine. Now throw your hands up in the sky. I go for mine. I gots to shine. Now throw your hands up in the sky. I'm going to get on this TV, mama. I'm going to put shit down. All right. So um, I I just thought I'd share Kanye West, T-Pain. I love that song. It was so perfect for this particular episode. Next week, Tiffany, you got us. You better research. I told folks, I'm a researcher. I don't be knowing half these songs. And then when I'm like, that's a good one. I got you. I got you got me. All right. Good deal. All right, folks. So join us in two weeks as we continue our conversations about that good life. We will discuss uh, the flow, right? Uh, We'll discuss the flow and continue to uh, talk about that. We do look forward to you joining us. And of course, in preparation for our discussions, we have included in the description where you can pick up a copy of the book Uh, to access all replays or learn more about Kinky Knots Cafes. Proactive is the way. Please visit www.kinkyknotscafe.com. Proactive is the way, my friends. Take good care.